Thank you. All right, praise the Lord. Good to see you all in the Lord's house. Facebook friend, we welcome you also. Thank you for joining us. Grab a hymn book in front of you and turn to page 149. Page 149, Trusting Jesus. Let's go there. Let's sing it together if you're able to stand. Four verses of this song, Trusting Jesus. Trusting as the moments fly, trusting as the day goes by, trusting him, whatever before, trusting Jesus, that is all. That's, that's good advice. That's a great sermon itself. So let's stand together and sing this wonderful song, Trusting Jesus. Page 149, as Brother Jerry led us into the song. Again, page 149. Trust in Jesus. Think about the words as you sing it. This evening in the book of 1st Samuel in chapter 30.
and looking at verses 6 through 10 of 1 Samuel chapter 30. 1 Samuel chapter 30, starting in verse 6 and on to verse 10. So there in the book of 1 Samuel, in chapter 30, and starting in verse 6, the word of the Lord reads, And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought thither the ephod to David. And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. So David went, he and the six hundred men that were with him, and came to the brook Besor, where those that were left behind stayed. But David pursued, he and four hundred men, for two hundred abode behind, which were so faint that they could not go over the brook be sore. Amen. Please be seated. All right, we're going to continue our study. First Samuel chapter 30. Keep your Bibles handy. Keep your Bibles open. By the way, good to see you, Jonah. 1 Samuel chapter 30, verses 6 through 10, as Brother Jared let us in reading. And David, David was a man after God's own heart. This man that it, it was a man after God's own heart is declining in his walk with God. David is backsliding in his walk with God. David actually forsook the people of God and went to live among the Philistines for a full year and four months. David was so discouraged, so declining in his walk with God, that he said, I don't want to be part of the, of the golly. I'm going to join the own golly. And he decided that he was going to fight with the ungodly against God's people. And I'm just giving you a review. But behind the scenes, God was at work in David's life trying to get David's attention. God did not allow David to fight against his own people. We, we, we saw that in our previous study that the Philistines' leaders, when they found out that David wanted to join the army, to be in their side to fight against God's people, they doubted. They doubted David and they put pressure on, on Achish, which was the Philistines' leaders. They said, we can't trust him. We can't have him on our side. He could turn on us. And they put so much pressure on Achish, the king of the Philistines, that the, uh, Achish sent David and his 600-man home to Siglach. And we saw that in 1 Samuel chapter 30, last Wednesday, in, verse, in, the, in the first three verses, that when David and his men got back to their home city, Siglach, they saw the city burn, and all their families and all their possessions, everything was all gone. The Amalekites conquered the city. They took everything. Everything that they had was lost. So David... We see David hit rock bottom. And David, God is about to get David's attention. And God allowed that to get David's attention because God was trying to bring David back to himself. And we see that in, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 30, in verse 6, 
we, we studied that verse, and I, I want to bring up that verse to your mind because I think it's a great verse, and I think all of us struggle with discouragement at times. And we need to be reminded that the same God uh, lift up David and help David could help you and me. So it says in 1 Samuel 36, and David was greatly distressed. You see, at this time, David was greatly distressed. He had no one to turn to for encouragement. It says that he was greatly distressed. It says that he had high gear distress. He had no one to turn for encouragement. Samuel was dead. Saul wanted to kill him. David's family is gone. Jonathan, his loyal friend, you know, uh, Saul's son, Jonathan, his loyal, he's nowhere to be found. He's not accessible to David. And now, the 600 man, his loyal 600 man, wants to take his life. What am I saying? David had no human being that he could turn to to get encouragement. What did David do during that low time of his life? Well, I want to I wanna bring to your attention again, 1 Samuel chapter 30, the last phrase is a very powerful phrase. It starts with David was greatly distressed. I mean, high gear discouragement, high gear distress, high gear stress. But look at the last phrase in 1 Samuel chapter 30 and verse 6, and you should underline it. If you got to mark it, you got to highlight it. Uh, uh, it says, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. He turns to the Lord to get real encouragement. And I believe that's the only place you and I could get real encouragement. Because when things go bad, where they will go bad, when things go real bad in our life, that's the only place we could find encouragement in the Lord. And I cannot overemphasize that. And I sound like a broken record, but because we always get discouraged and we face uh, uh, moments of discouragement, that's like a broken record in our life. And we need to be reminded that the, 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 the only place that you could find real encouragement is in the Lord. That's the only place. And this is a marvelous practice that you and I ought to be doing more and more, encouraging ourselves in the Lord. That's a marvelous practice that you and I need to, to practice every single day of our life. How did David encourage himself in the Lord his God? Well, don't lose your spot. Let me take you to Psalm chapter 42, verse 5. How did David encourage himself in the Lord his God? Go to Psalm chapter 42, verse 5. Let me show you how David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And this is a formula for us during downtime, during a high level of discouragement and stress and anxiety that we experience. This is a formula that you and I could, could follow. How did David encourage himself in the Lord his God? Psalm 42, verse 5. Look at it. Psalm 42, verse 5. David says, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieting in me? Hope thou in God. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, God is, he, you know what David is doing here? He's preaching to himself. He's talking to himself. We're pretty good in preaching to others. How about preach to yourself? How about if I preach to myself, amen? How about if I encourage myself and I preach to myself? You know, I'm always looking for ways to motivate Jose Santos. You need to look for ways to motivate yourself, amen? David is talking to himself. David is, I hear Frankie many times, talking to himself and putting himself down and rebuking himself, and, and we need to do that, amen? Look, I, I rebuke myself. I put myself down. I said, get with it. Stop being lazy. Stop making excuses. Amen? Carmen, you do the same thing. We need to do that. Amen? So why? Because God is going to deliver you. He is going to deliver you. Amen? I don't care what your problem is. He is going to deliver you. He wants to deliver you. He wants you to look to him. Amen? So David here, what is he doing? He's preaching to himself. Why am I discouraged? Why am I greatly distressed? Why am I cast down? What's the matter with you, soul? What's your problem? Don't you hope in God? He's going to deliver you. You know, you don't need to be discouraged. God's still on the throne. God is still in control. 
God can't help you in your situation. God is not going to let you down. You need to talk to yourself that way, amen? Preach that sermon to yourself when you're down. Hope in God. Put your trust in God, amen? That's what we need to do. We need to learn this marvelous practice to learn to talk to ourselves and encourage ourselves in the Lord and say to ourselves, don't you hope in God? Why? Because we all face tough situation. We all face discouragement situation where we need to be lifted up. And the only place to find that encouragement is by turning to the Lord and realizing, hey, it's not out of God's control. He's still in control. He's still on the throne. He's going to work everything out for us. Put your hope in God. That's what David did. Isn't that good stuff? I don't know about you, but that encouraged me, amen? I need to, to, to preach to myself and talk to myself like David did. And that's exactly what we see David here in 1 Samuel chapter 30. He's talking to himself and he's encouraging himself in the Lord his God. When David hit rock bottom, he turned his eyes to the Lord. He encouraged himself in the Lord. He strengthened himself in the Lord. Can I tell you, Christian, God's strength is available for every Christian tonight. I'll say that again. God's strength is available for every Christian sitting here tonight, hearing my voice. His divine power is available for every believer. God gave us his divine power to live a life of godliness, to live a victorious life. God gave us his divine power. In fact, in, 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 in 2 Peter chapter 1, we don't turn there, but in 1 Peter chapter in 2 Peter chapter 1, in verses 3 to 4, Peter talks about that. Peter talks about what's available for the Christian, and he mentioned that we have his divine power available for us to live a life of godliness. He mentioned there also that we have his power to escape the corruption that is in the world. He mentioned his precious promises that are available for us to use, promises of victory. In 2 Peter chapter 1, in verse 3 and 4, you know why he also mentioned Why? Because we are partakers of the divine nature. He said we have God's divine nature. We have the Spirit of God living in our soul. And because of the, of the Holy Spirit living in us, and because we got God's nature, and because we got God's power, divine power available for us, and his precious promises, hey, we could strengthen ourselves with the Lord with those resources available for us. Amen? So what am I saying tonight? I'm saying that God's divine power, God's strength is available for every child of God tonight. I love the last phrase in 1 Samuel chapter 30. In fact, uh, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me, right? Philippians 4.13, right? I can do all things, not something, through Christ which strengthens we, we have his power, his strength. I love the last phrase in 1 Samuel chapter 30 in verse 6. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. I love that. He didn't wait for somebody else to come and encourage him. He encouraged himself in the Lord his God. He went to get God's strength. He went to get God's strength. And let me tell you tonight, go out and get God's strength. You discouraged? Go out and get God's strength. You're not going to get it automatic. You better come to God and go get it. Amen? And uh, God gave his people, you know, it's interesting that in, in Exodus, you remember the, the people of God that they were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years? Remember God's provision never ran low? Those 40 years in the wilderness, remember how God gave them fresh manna from heaven every single day? Fresh manna from, 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 from heaven. Sent by God every single day for 40 years. Every day, fresh manna. But it's interesting to me that in Exodus chapter 16, in verse 16, to what it says in Exodus chapter 16, in verse 16, it says, This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded, gather of every man according to his eating. So God gave them fresh manna from heaven every day, but God did not force them to take it. God did not shove that in their mouth. God said, here it is. Get out of your tent and go get it. Hey, are you discouraged? Are you discouraged about your problem? God's strength is available. But guess what? God's not going to shove it on you. God's not going to force you to take it. You must come to God and get it. 
I must come to God and get it. You're not going to get it automatic. Amen? It's available. God's promises to feed upon, to get spiritual nutrition, are available in the King James Bible. God said, come and get it. Open that book and come and claim those promises and come get God's strength. How, do you, how to use God's strength? Well, first, go get it. Go get it. What David do? What did David do with the strength he received from the Lord? Well, for sure, David got everything that he was that was taken from him. He got it back and even more. He lost everything. All the possessions. His family was gone. But you know what? He got everything back and more. And more. So, how David? get to the place where he lost everything and recover it all back and much more? Well, let's look how he did it. Let's see how he used God's strength. Let's look at the steps that he took. Look at verse 7, I mean verse 6. 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6. But David, the last part, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. So he went in, first went and go after God's strength. Then verse 7, it says, and David said to Abiathar, the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And, and Abiathar brought hither the ephod to David. Now, we, we started it. The high priest wore an ephod. And inside the ephod was what you call the urim and the thummim. And we studied that one, one way. This was an Old Testament way to seek the will of God. And the high priest, Abiathar, with the ephah helped David to discover and seek the will of God. And look, I believe with all my heart when I read that because David is seeking the will of God when he, when he asked Abitiata to get the ephah because that was the way in the Old Testament to seek the will of God. I believe that it is God's clear will that we stay encouraged in the Lord. That's God's will for you and me. It's not God's will for you to be discouraged and be distressed and be sad and have no joy of the Lord. That is not God's will for your life. God's will, God's clear will for your life and my life, and that you will stay encouraged in the Lord, that you will stay motivated in the Lord, that you stay right with God with the joy of the Lord every single day of your life. That's God's will for our life. And we ought to be seeking that will more than anything else. The next step is verse 8. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after the troop? Shall I overtake them? So the first thing David did after he received strength from the Lord, he inquired of the Lord. God, what do you want me to do? God, where do you want me to go? A lot of times we don't even bother to ask those questions to God. Sometimes when we do ask the Lord, it's not really sincerely. We do it not sincerely. We do it when we decided that we're going to make our own plans for our own selfish purpose, and then we ask God to bless it. And you know what James chapter 4, verse 3 calls that? That's a asking or praying amiss. That's selfish prayer. And James 4, 3 says, You ask and receive now because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your own lust. So many times that's how we pray. It's not sincere. We pray a, a selfish prayer after we make our own plans, and then we want God to bless our plans. It doesn't work that way. Look at how sincerely and passionately David asked God. Verse 8, shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? David was a mighty soldier. Think about it. David knew how to fight the enemy. He was a mighty soldier. He knew how to attack the enemy. He knew how to defeat the enemy. He was a mighty soldier. He could have easily took matters in his own hand because he, he had the, uh, the, uh, the expertise. But no, he took it to the Lord in prayer. Lord, what you want me to do? Lord, I need your guidance. And let's look at the Lord's answer. There in the middle of verse 8, 1 Samuel 30, verse 8, he answered her pursuit. For thou shalt surely overtake them and without fail recover all. I mean, how do you think David felt when he heard that? God, you're so, kind to, you're so kind to me. God, you're so good to me. 
Here's a man who's running from God for one year and four months. Here's a man who ignore the promises of God. Here's a man who disregard God's word. Here's a man who behave in a way that was disrespectful to the name of the Lord. And the first moment that he turned back to God in repentance, God speak a promise of victory to this man. Thank you, Lord, for answering my prayer. I mean, think about that scene, how encouraged, how grateful David was. Where after he turned his back on God for so many years, God still answered his prayers after he ignored God for a year and a half. And I hope when you read this, how God answered David, that there's something inside of your heart that says, God, you're so good and kind, and, and uh, you don't give us what our sins deserve. That's what I read. When I read that, I was like, God, you are a merciful God. You are a good God. You are a, a kind God, Lord. You are a forgiving God, Lord. You are God of second chances, Lord. I mean, that's the, that really blessed my heart. That's my God, and that's your God. Amen? Amen? Psalm 103, verse 10. Listen to Psalm 103, verse 10. He has not dealt with us after our own sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquity. That's right, Diane. Thank God tonight. God does not treat us as our sin deserve or pay us according to our sins. And David realized that, amen? And he, I believe he's praising God. He's having a praise time, a, a praise time here because God answered his prayer. After he turned his back on God for about a year and a half, despising God's word, ignoring God's promises. Many of us can say amen to that, where God, thank God that God does not treat us according to our sins. I'm convinced David was grateful for God answering him and for the promise of victory that God gave him. Thank you, Lord, for answering me. Thank you, Lord, for the promise of victory. Oh, God, I'm going to believe it. I'm going to claim it. I'm going to use it. God told him, hey, what should I do? Should I pursue the truth? Should I pursue? Go ahead and pursue. You're going to recover all. You got my promise. And David believed that promise, and he claimed it and acted on it. And that's what we need to do with God's promises. Amen? So how David used God's strength. Well, first, David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. First, you got to go get that strength. It's not going to come to you automatic. You need to repent. You need to confess that you're not right with God, that you, you have ignored his word, you have ignored his promises, you have turned your back on God, you go in your own way. You need to acknowledge that and, and come to repentance and encourage yourself in the Lord your God and gain some strength so you can start living in God's strength, not in your own strength. Amen. So how David used God's strength? Well, first, David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Second, he, required, he inquired of the Lord. He took it to the Lord in prayer. Third, he received and believed God's promise and act on it. God has a promise of victory for your life and my life. There's many promises of victory that God has for us in his book. And we ought to claim it. We ought to believe it and act on it. David believed it. With all his heart, and he believed in some other, he's ready to move to action. We, God has a promise of victory for you, your life, and my life. Let me give you two, just example two. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. What a promise. Thanks be to God, which give us the victory, not the defeat. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 2.14 is another promise of victory for us. 2 Corinthians 2.14, thanks, now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. But I believe what the devil wants to do in your life and my life is to rob you of God's promises of victory. That's what he wants, making you think that God does not want to use you. Making you think that God is done with you, that you went too far in your sinning and you're disqualified from being used by God. The devil will do anything he can to hinder you, discourage you, and get you off God's promises of victory. And some of you are, are, are falling in the trap. You don't, you don't believe God's word. You don't believe God's word and you don't, you don't, you don't believe it, you don't claim it, and you don't act on it. 
Satan will love to do that, but David did not fall for the devil's lies. David had a promise of victory from God. God wants to use me. I will believe God's promise of victory. I will act on it. I will pursue the enemy with God's strength, with prayer to God, with God's promise and I, a, a, a victory, and I'm going to recover everything. God told him that. That was a promise of victory from God. He believed it. He claimed it. He acted on it. You too, Christian, can recover your strong walk with God. You could recover it. You could recover your lost testimony. You could recover your sorry, bad testimony. You could get it back, amen? You could have a good testimony. Hey, ask Peter. He backslide. He ruined his... He got it back. He was restored, amen? Ask David here. He got it back after he turned his back for a year and a half. He got it back. Amen? You could recover your walk with God, your lost testimony, your bad testimony. Hey, you could recover your marriage. Anybody listen to me online, your marriage falling apart. You could recover that if you really want. Amen? If both of you want it, come to God. Get some counsel from a spiritual man and salvage the marriage for the kid's sake. Amen. You could recover that with God's help. I could do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. Amen. Just follow the steps of David. Strengthen yourself in the Lord. Inquire of the Lord. Receive and believe God's promise and act on it. David, I believe boldly, went after the promise of victory that God gave him. When I read this, how he just moved to action, he act on the promise, he believed it. He was strengthened. God heard his prayer. And David, you know what David really did? He did what, what we're going to do in, in, in the prayer meeting. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the eternal grace that we may obtain mercy and find, gra and find grace to help in the time of need. That's exactly what David did. He claimed the help, the grace. He was in need. He was a mess. He hit rock bottom. And you know what? Come boldly, Christian. Come with confidence. Because God wants to give you strength. God wants to give you real encouragement that no human being could give you. 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 9. Look at it. 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 9. It says, so David went. I love that. So David went, and he and his 600 men that were with him. I love that. Simple obedience in David's part. Simple obedience. Three simple words there in 1 Samuel 39. So David went. That's pretty simple. It's not that complicated. That's pretty simple. God told David to do something, and David did it without resisting. It was not complicated for David to do it. It was simple for David to obey, but when the Lord tells us to do something, it becomes complicated to us. We come up with a lot of excuses, a lot of uh, 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 justification. We come up with a lot of rationalizations. We say, the Lord understands how complicated it is for me. The Lord understands my schedule. Look, we all get 24 hours. No, it's, 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 it's complicated in our eyes. In our eyes. It's complicated. We said that, look, friends, I believe the Lord wants us to understand the simplicity of obedience. Obedience. You want to be, uh, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. The simplicity of obedience, the secret to receive God's blessing and God's strength and God's power and God's protection and God's favor in your life is obedient, simple obedience. Whatever God tells you to do in this book, do it. Read your Bible every day. Do it. Pray every day. Do it. Go to church faithfully. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Do it. Go preach Jesus. Tell people about Jesus. Go out soul winning. Do it. Bring your tithes and offering to the Lord. The ABCs of the Christian life. Do it. And you'll be blessed. Live a, live a separated life in this world. Don't be worldly. Don't be carnal. Do it. And that's how you're going to. That's the key. The simplicity of obedience. I believe the Lord wants us to understand the simplicity of obedience. 
By the way, that's what it means to have Jesus Christ as your Lord. You know that? Jesus said to do it, and you do it. Listen to what Jesus says in John chapter 6, verse 46. Jesus is in John chapter 6 and verse 46. And why you call, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? And then he says in, in John 15, 14, you are my friends. If you do whatsoever I command you. So look, what good is it if we say that Jesus is our Lord and that Jesus is our best friend? And we don't do what he says we should do. Listen, Christian, if your life is not marked by simple obedience to the Lord, don't call him your Lord. Don't call him. He's not your Lord. Because he says, if you do what, why call me your Lord and do the things that I say? In Luke 6, 46, he says, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I commanded you. So if your life is not marked by simple obedience to the teachings and the commands of this book, don't call him your Lord and don't call him your best friend either. Don't call him that. You only call yourself a religious fan of Jesus, not a serious follower of Christ. I didn't say you were not saved. I said you're not a serious follower of Christ. You, you could be a fan of Jesus. How about being a serious follower of Christ? Because when he's your best friend, you do what he says. When he's your Lord, you do what he says. If there's something in your life right now that is clear in the scripture that Jesus told you to do it, and you're not doing it, then Jesus is not your Lord then Jesus is not your best friend. And I believe David's God was his Lord. David's God was his Lord. God was his best friend. God told him to do something, and he went. Simple obedience. 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 9. And they, so David went. He and the 600 men that were with him. Now, this is interesting. Look at it again. 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 9. So David went, that's simple obedience, and the 600 men that were with him. Now, this is interesting. Here, here, let, me, let me give you a contrast. This is interesting. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6. 1 Samuel chapter 30, look at verse 6. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, that the 600 men. Because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his son and for his daughters. Look, the 600 men here spake of stoning him. They went from stoning David in verse 6, and then three verses down, they are following David. Isn't that interesting? What happened? Brother Mike, what, what happened? Something happened to their hearts, Amen. They, they, they doubted his leadership. We're going to kill you. It's your fault. They blame him. Now they're following him. Brother Jared, isn't that amazing? Something happened, brother. Something happened, sister. Why? What happened? Well, I believe David proved that he was who God claimed him to be, a man after God's own heart. They saw David getting right with God and strengthened himself in the Lord his God, and that example inspired them. It was evident to all of David's 600 men that David knew how to go, get a hold of God when he was wrong. He knew how to get right with God. They doubted his leadership's ability before, but now they know that David is the man that they should be following. These men saw how David handled their valid criticism with humility and by turning to the Lord, and that example inspired them. But let me just give you a footnote here. When the critics... David's 600 men began their valley criticism of David, because it was valid. You got to give it to them, it was valid. David did wrong. He's trying to put them in danger and put them in the, in the devil's crowd to go fight against God's people. So when the critics, David's 600 men began the valley criticism of David, David responded by turning to the Lord in prayer. He knew that retaliation was not the answer, but the Lord's guiding was the answer. 
in the face of criticism, David turned to the Lord for encouragement and guidance. And listen, there's a lesson for you and I tonight. When we are criticized and attacked, our best response is to take our troubles and our critics to the Lord. Because too often we try to take the matters into our own hand. We want to handle our critics. We want to go on in the defensive. We want to tell our critics off. We want to put them in their place. And we develop a spirit of bitterness towards our, the, the, uh, those who criticize us. Our best action is to take it to the Lord and ask God to show us if their criticism is valid, which was valid for them. And if it is, deal with it. Amen? Get right. Deal with it. If it's not, then leave the critics in the hands of God. Don't take matters in your own hands. Do like Romans 12, 19 tell us, dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay it, sayest the Lord. So that, what happened? That's what caused them to follow David. They wanted to store him to that, and now that example of humility, that example of turning to the Lord, that example of making things right with God and strengthening himself in the Lord, and inquired of the Lord, and they saw that, that David received a promise from God, he believed it, he obeyed it, and that inspired them. That's the leader we're going to follow. Amen. By the way, that's the kind of leader you and I need to be. I could picture the scene of David after he got right with God, coming to his 600 men, saying, okay, put the rocks down. God heard my prayer and gave me a promise of victory. I'm supposed to pursue the Amalekites, and I'm going to recover all without fail. God gave me a promise. David said, I believe God's promise. I am going to act on it. I'm going. Who's going with me? If none of you are going with me, I'm going. Amen. I could just picture that scene. Such faith in God stirred this man's heart. Such faith in God inspired those men's hearts. This time, they're fighting the real enemies, not God's people. This time, they're fighting the Lord's battles, not their own battles. This time, they're not in for themselves. They're in it all the way for God. Now they're in a mission for God. And by the way, we need to fight the right battles. Not fighting other Christians, not fighting each other. Why don't you get in the real battle? Fight the real enemy. Amen? Because that's the, ba the, the battle is the Lord's. And we need to fight a good fight of faith. There was not an army on earth that will stop David and his men when they were walking in the will of God and they started walking in God's strength. There was not an army on earth that could stop them because now they're fighting the right battle. Now they're in the center of God's will. Now they got God's strength in their heart. And there was not an army on earth that could stop these men. And by the way, there's not an army on this earth. The, the devil has a lot of opposition against God's people and, the, and the, the, against Christians. But I'm telling you, if we lean on God's strength, if we fight God's battle, if we be in the center of God's will, we are unstoppable. Amen? Because greater is he in you than he that is in the world. So, why this man? Because they were using God's strength properly. How do you use God's strength properly, boy? How, how did David use God's strength? Well, first, he strengthened himself in the Lord his God. First, you got to go get that strength. I believe David repented. He got right with the Lord when he encouraged himself in the Lord. He didn't make excuses. He came clean with God. First, strengthen yourself in the Lord your God. Go get that strength. Go get right. Then David inquired of the Lord. David started asking for God's direction, and then he received God's strength and use it properly he received god's promise and and, and believe god's promise and then he act on that promise and that's what we need to do tonight amen look receive god's strength use it properly to fight the right battle god will give you a promise claim it believe it act on it amen let's stand on our feet every head bowed every eye closed you heard the message I hope God spoke to your heart. I hope you came here to get something from God. And I hope you put to practice what you heard. Because you know you're doing it in your own strength, and it's not going to work. You know you're not victorious. 
You know you don't have the, you know you're not right with the Lord. You're going to continue to live that life like that? You're going to do it your own way? Or well, you're going to be defeated. You have no joy, no empty, no satisfaction. So as the music play, the invitation is open if you need to respond to the message, if you need to get alone with God and pray. In some areas that God spoke to you about, I hope you were tender. I hope God spoke to you in some area that you're coming sure that you, you, you need to strengthen that area in the Lord. Well, let's, let's do serious business with God tonight. Let's put the message to practice.